Hello and welcome to our Monticello live stream. I'm Melanie Boyer and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Bill Barker, who is Monticello's historical interpreter. He's been interpreting Thomas Jefferson for over 30 years and we're looking forward to talking a little bit more today about his career as Jefferson. So let us know where you're joining from and please leave any questions that you have in the comments. So let's just jump right in, Bill. All right, I'm Thanks ready. for joining me here. My pleasure and Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to all of us here uh, today. Pleasure to be myself. That's right. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's start out. When and why did you decide to pursue portraying Thomas Jefferson? I, I don't know whether there was a when, to tell you the honest truth. Uh, I certainly know the why, and, and the why remains uh, very simply because he is, uh, he's never boring, and he's so relevant to everything that continues to go on, uh, certainly for me. I would say when began when I was a, a, a young boy and my family would stop here on our way from Philadelphia down to North Carolina to visit our father's families down there. And uh, I still remember, I think, the very first trip when, as I watch on the faces of so many children, who visit Monticello and their wonder and their curiosity, nonetheless with me, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. What is this place? Who are these folks that, that are living here? And uh, it was um, about ready to rain. So my father wanted to uh, rally all of us, get us into the car and head on. And uh, for whatever reason, my, my mother said, no, no, I want to go down to the graveyard first. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's go mm -hmm. down. And my father said, oh, absolutely not. We're not we can't do that. Look, the heavens are going to open up. And, and my mother, for whatever reason, grabbed me and started pulling me away from the car where my father grabbed my two younger brothers and put them in the back seat. <laughs> and the heavens opened up and my mother continued on. She she took me down to the graveyard. I knew it was raining, but the thing that was fascinating to me was to stand there and look through those bars. And after seeing the house and uh, hearing about Thomas Jefferson, I, I asked, is he there? Mm. And, and my mother replied, well, all that is left of his mortal remains, but his spirit is here. Now, you say something like that to a, a young child, and, uh, and that opens up a whole new realm. And I think that's what charged me early on. I was very interested to read about him mm -hmm. and uh, to um, to get interested in him. So I went into theater work. I was a history major uh, in in college. I went to school in Philadelphia, and uh, but I could not stay off the mm -hmm. stage. And uh, so I think it was that final melding of, of an interest in history and uh, my propensity to theater and acting that got me into this uh, beginning about the early 1980s. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, like, when did you start and what were some of your early presentations like? Yeah, it was about, about 1980. I, I remember being hired uh, to portray Jefferson. Why? Because I had folks come up to me in Philadelphia, particularly a uh, a teacher in the Philadelphia public school system. He taught Pennsylvania history uh, in fourth grade. His name was Carl Gatter. And uh, he came up to me one day and said, did anyone ever tell you you look like Jefferson? Mm -hmm. I said, what, Carl? And he says, well, many of us think you do. And they need one at Independence Hall for photo ops and presentations. I had long red hair, rather geeky looking. Um, the little red hair has long gone. <laughs> and Carl, by the way, uh, was well known throughout Philadelphia portraying William Penn. Carl and his wife would portray William and Hannah Penn and they would go around to fourth grade classrooms in Philadelphia public schools and breathe life into the history books. So that's how it started. Uh, Independence Hall and, um, and then I connected with a, uh, a theater company known as the American Historical Theater that was uh, led by uh, the late Bill Summerfield and his wife, the late Pamela Summerfield. Uh, Bill uh, had become well known for portraying George Washington. And he was the first George Washington at Mount Vernon as an historic interpreter. So um, that just was the beginnings and, and had followed through. 
Great. And you worked for many years at Colonial Williamsburg? I was 27 and... years at Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, if you're noticing a book that's on our that's table right. here, um, thank you, Mel. This is um, my, I, I, it's, a, it's a legacy uh, for Colonial Williamsburg, uh, becoming Jefferson, my life uh, as a founding father. And uh, this was written for Williamsburg. I, I don't receive a cent from it. So this is a nice little mm -hmm. donor's gift for Colonial Williamsburg. And it's all in there. So, and you can buy it in our shop as well if you come to exactly. Monticello. Exactly. It's for sale here in our shop at Monticello. Okay. So let's turn to some of the decisions that you make when you're interpreting Jefferson. So such as what kind of accent you use, what kind of clothing you wear, and the age that you portray him, which I guess he ages with you. He ages. <laughs> I age with him. He ages <laughs> with me. Uh, as I said, the long, the red hair is long gone. Uh, the accent I, mm -hmm. from the very beginning, I would have never thought of putting the costume on without uh, a semblance of a Southern accent. I come into it naturally. Uh, both on my mother's side, my mother's mother's family was from Virginia and my father's family, uh, originally from Virginia, South Side, moving into Northern North Carolina uh, before the American Revolution. Uh, my brothers and I still have the old farm down there. And when I first began reading Jefferson letters and thinking about him in persona and in his time and in his world, and the fact that he was at least four generations removed from the Jefferson progenitor, the mm -hmm. first male Jefferson who came into Virginia, let alone the near the same, about two or three generations removed from his mother's family. And when I say removed, moving westward, farther and farther away from what ever would have been referred to as a British accent at the time, uh, I just could hear uh, what we would refer to as a Southern accent mm -hmm. in those letters. And uh, and my father, uh, I'm a generation removed. My father was born in 1894. Mm. And uh, I remember he had a, a thick Southern accent. He lived in Philadelphia a good 40 years before I was born. And uh, I remember asking him, did, did your father uh, have an accent like you do? And he said, my daddy had an accent like I do, but a little thicker. And I remember my granddaddy Barker and his accent was so thick, he hardly understand it. Hmm. So this gave me mm -hmm. further verification. And then there's something else historically. We rarely think about this. Um, the kinescopes that are left us of the Civil War reunions when mm -hmm. sound came into movies. Mm -hmm. This is back at Gettysburg and, and uh, Antietam. When you listen to the old Southern veterans, who are in their 90s at that time, and they're still touting uh, the rebel charge, the rebel yell, but listen to their accents. And you know, this is what, one or two generations removed from Jefferson's mm -hmm. generation. So that accent simply didn't happen overnight by any means. So that's why I choose uh, to interpret Mr. Jefferson with an accent. Everyone has their own choices in historical interpretation. But uh, that remains uh, my choice. And I, I, again, I think it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What about the clothing that you wear? Well, you know, we've been fortunate to have uh, on our staff here, historian uh, Gay Wilson, who has written a book, uh, mm -hmm. Jefferson on Parade. Mm -hmm. And she's gone into great detail uh, through Jefferson's memorandum books and his letters as to uh, how Jefferson appareled himself. Uh, having been with Colonial Williamsburg for uh, uh, more than two decades, uh, we certainly had the advantage of our costume department and to uh, have um, precise detail and the historical uh, knowledge there. So I was first clothed as Thomas Jefferson uh, at Colonial Williamsburg in what Williamsburg considered uh, to be appropriate mm -hmm. for him. And, uh, and I know Gay Wilson had something to do with that. She certainly did uh, in helping uh, Kurt Smith, uh, who is the young Jefferson with Colonial Williamsburg now in his apparel. So I've tried, tried as best I can to fulfill uh, what uh, we think he may have mm -hmm. uh, worn. Um, they're varying accounts. In fact, I think, didn't we do a, uh, 
was it a live stream or a podcast mm -hmm. about that letter written by the Reverend Bumstead in, in That's Calvary? Right. Yeah. That's right. Oh, that was the animation video. Too. That was the animation yeah, video. Yeah, the one that Jeff Looney did. Yeah, yeah, yeah that where, was great. Where, what is he wearing? A checkered gingham suit, <laughs> three-piece right. gingham suit. And, and what does he have? A an umbrella? That's right. A lady's parasol. A lady's parasol. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking up. I, I've not done that yet. I've not done that yet. There's still time. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so there we are. We're at, we're at, a, we're at our leisure and we're, that, we're at our pleasure, at least I am, in uh, dressing how he would have dressed. You know, they say eyewitness accounts are that he was very simply dressed, mm -hmm. though in, in very fine materials and very plainly. Uh, I often envision him, envision him somewhat as a, a Quaker, perhaps, hmm. of the time. And, uh, you know, in, in drab colors, although we know he certainly favored red. He was renowned for a oh, red, yeah. red waskit. Uh, you have a really nice red suit. I, I, wore I, I, have, time. I have red yeah. breeches. Yeah. I wore mm -hmm. that for some of our holiday. And we know Jefferson had a pair of red mm -hmm. breeches. He brought, bought the material when he was in Strasbourg. So that's historically recognized. And uh, I know one of our first uh, paintings of Mr. Jefferson by John Trumbull. Actually, it's a composite of the, uh, of the committee to draft the declaration. Uh, is the result of Trumbull actually visiting with as many uh, of the former delegates of the Continental Congress, and particularly the committee that drafted the declaration, uh, to see if they remembered what they were wearing. So he could make that somewhat mm -hmm. historically correct. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, what about just later in life, though? I, I remember hearing accounts of Jefferson's tattered kind of clothing. That's, well, yes. And that I, doesn't have to do with you. I was oh, just more oh, interested. Yes, but. It, I have many <laughs> tattered raiments that are 30 years old that I, I continue to, to wear, particularly with pride here at Monticello. I, I can still fit into one or two of the frock coats uh, uh, from Independence Hall in the streets in Philadelphia, and they are very tattered and, mm -hmm. uh, and comfortable. There you go. Well, we have an, a couple of audience questions here. April asks if you find yourself thinking like Jefferson and melding with his personality. <laughs> well, April, is that not the question uh, of historical interpretation? And I, I should go further and say uh, uh, first, yes, of course, but further to say that historical interpretation uh, is acting. It, it is theater. The moment you put that costume on, you, you, you are performing in the persona, uh, at least of that costume. So as an actor, and, and this is how I came into it, essentially, the purpose of an actor is to enwrap themselves in that personality, enwrap themselves in the character, to gain as best an understanding of the depths of, of that character's heart and soul and mind. And the more so to be ready uh, on, in the moment, on the spare of the moment in historical interpretation to reply as, as the individual. And so when you're an actor in a performance on a script, well, you know the reply, it's already there. And, and you're replying off another character and then never forget the audience is also one of the characters on the stage as well. But when you're solely in persona, yes, April, you have to take on uh, the thoughts of that individual. Now, does that lead me to think about him as him outside of my costume? Well, I can tell you with respect to some of our national concerns, our government concerns, uh, our nation's politics during various eras and times, and I've lived through uh, a number of them, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I somewhat hold a Jefferson uh, opinion and, and observation of that relative to what's going on, because I think so much that he engage, was engaged in during his time is still going on. And, and so, yeah, I'm, do I hold that for everything in his mind? Absolutely not. No. But, but you know, I, I'd like to think the past was not less intelligent than we are today and have not yet come to an idea of how things can be better and improved upon and new frontiers of science and, uh, and information to be discovered. So yeah, I'm not gonna skirt that question by saying, no, I, I don't think like him at times, it, it happens. 
We have one other question from Deborah asking if there are aspects of Jefferson's life that are still a mystery because of the lack of documentation or his silence on certain topics. Oh my heavens, yes. Yes, Deborah, there certainly are. And um, as you know, he was devoted to privacy, personal privacy, which is something we should never forget ourselves. Uh, it is something so very important, particularly, I think, for the privacy uh, of who you are and, and the, the sanity of who you are and the intimacy uh, that you welcome into your life. So by all means, Deborah, there is an awful lot. What, what is it that we will... I, I, I think everything that we are interested in about Jefferson, and remember, everyone <laughs> has their own opinion about Mr. Jefferson and his interests. Uh, I think all of it holds an element of secrecy. I think all of it uh, involves perhaps letters he wrote, mm -hmm. opinions he wrote, observations he wrote, which we will never know uh, because he destroyed them. We know that about his right. wife. We know that, that about his wife mm -hmm. and his mother. But so did Mrs. Washington. And uh, she destroyed everything with respect to her relationship with her husband. What further is there about Sally Hemings that we don't know that was was there and evident? You know, has that all been destroyed? Unless we find it somewhere further, and that can happen can happen any day. We can always find that you know, uh, in an attic somewhere where it's been locked up or forgotten, or in within the pages of a book that has not been taken out of a library for generations. So yes, I think there is much that we will uh, we will never know, and um, and then much that uh, uh, calls on us to continue to pursue it and find it, and. Uh, provide some conclusions if we, if we can in our research and, uh, and our studies. Okay, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Natalia wonders how you prepare for your role as Jefferson. Do you use a script? You don't, right? Well, well, Natalia- Well, I guess the, Jefferson's he, words are- and He wrote the, over 20,000 right? letters, so there's a script I wouldn't want to begin to memorize by, by any respect. But no, his letters, yeah. you know, his public paper, papers. Uh, so do I continually refer to them? Yes, in order to double check what I am saying. That's true, even before live streams sometimes. He, very much before live streams. I, I want to be prepared for what we're- are going to uh, receive from you all that we do not know, mm -hmm. you know, in your questions. So yes, I'm continually preparing, continually trying to keep up on things, continually realizing there just is so much I don't know, nor will ever know. And yet if put on the spot to be able to uh, refer to mm -hmm. something that we do know or something right. that I, I am secure with in that regard. Uh, or simply to say in persona, oh, well, I have not thought about that for years, mm -hmm. but I think I wrote it down. So I'll have to simply refer to what I remember writing down to clarify it. So yes, it's a continual work in progress. But it's much more than acting. I mean, you are a Jefferson scholar in your own right. I mean, from having done so much research, one of the most well-read Jefferson scholars dare say. Mel, you are very <laughs> kind. You are very kind. I, I, I said at the beginning, he, he has never ceased to fascinate me. I find him continually relevant. And uh, for that in itself, I continue to read and try to acquaint myself. And, and that's not any the less with contemporary authors uh, as well. I continue to, to bone up on, on new Jefferson uh, histories and, uh, and books that come out about him. And um, I always try to, to, to keep searching and validating the facts, mm. the facts of something that he has written, because that is my persona. That is how I have to answer to people as best I can with what he said. Keep it in a context. That's so important, keeping it in a context. So thank you for the recognition that uh, yep, I, I do continue to study. Mm, yeah. Uh, hold on. We had another question here. So Chester is asking if you miss doing any non-Jefferson acting, and maybe you could talk about that. Like, what, what would you have done if you didn't portray Jefferson? I, Chester, um, firstly, let me just say this. Uh, as an actor, 
to be able to take on a persona, to take on a historically significant and validated individual, so influential, not only through our nation still, but across the globe, and to take this on is just to continually realize it is no overnight occupation or vocation, that, that it continues, and it is extraordinary to have that opportunity. Do, do I miss acting in a Shakespeare? Do I miss acting in, um, uh, in an old coward play? Do I miss acting in a, a, a Gilbert and Sullivan? Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I, I love all of the aforementioned and many, many more playwrights and, and continue to read and go to the theater wherever I possibly can. Uh, run up to New York and, uh, and see what's just debuted. And um, I have the great pleasure still, because once you're a Savoyard, you're always a Savoyard, uh, to be um, associated with the Savoy Opera Company of Philadelphia. Uh, I performed in many of those uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's uh, that were produced at the Academy of Music in Philadelphia and then down at uh, Longwood Gardens near Philadelphia, uh, beginning in about 1981. And uh, I was artistic director for them uh, for well over uh, over 10 years. And so it's in my soul and, uh, and I continue to uh, hum and uh, whistle those melodies uh, on occasion. So there in, there in itself, from what I've been saying, yeah, I do miss it, but uh, I'm, I'm very satisfied and, uh, and very privileged to, to be doing what I have been doing. So let's turn to some of your favorite moments from your years of playing Jefferson. Um, can you tell us about some of your favorite moments or any unusual requests or questions that you've gotten? Mel, this is a favorite moment. And I mean that sincerely, <laughs> to be seated with you all right here in the North Permit Pavilion, mind you, and to look right out the mm. window. And there is a internationally renowned icon of, of freedom, contradiction, uh, a regard to human nature, who we all are, how each of us finds ourselves in Jefferson and continues to carry on uh, the, the, the conversation, the arguments, and the debates. These are, these are sublime mm -hmm. moments. They really yeah. are. And, and they are ones of great pleasure and, and uh, at the same time, great weight in trying to hold on to that and continue to grapple with that in a better understanding, you know, of, of who we are as Americans. Um, mm -hmm. I've been privileged to portray Jefferson many places, and uh, certainly Colonial Williamsburg, nonetheless, Independence Hall, uh, the Capitol Building, the National Archives, the White House, uh, overseas in the Palace of Versailles, uh, in London, uh, at Strasbourg, I referred to that earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I, but you know, as Jefferson used to say, the earth belongs to the living generation. You know, mm -hmm. it's the present, it's right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what's going to happen tomorrow? You know, that continues to beckon. So there have been many, many pleasant memories. And um, yet tomorrow, I, I'm certain will be another one. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Do you ever disagree with Jefferson about his positions and ideas? And does it make it difficult at times to present him to the public? Yes. Yes, I disagree with him uh, uh, quite many times when I read over and over again. Did he actually write that? Oh, come on. But, you know, this is still Jefferson. This is part of Jefferson. He, he welcomes you to disagree. He welcomes you to enter into that argument and the debate. So many passages in his notes on the state of Virginia. I mean, we pause and we say, what? What was he saying? You know, and then you try to correct it in public, you know, in first person and say, well, you know, I wrote that solely for private distribution, 200 copies privately printed that I personally handed out. Oh, yeah, but wait, just wait a minute, Mr. Jefferson. You know, what about this passage or that passage, particularly upon uh, the, the institution of enslaving another individual? And then you try to come back on that in this, as Mr. Jefferson with exactly what he wrote. Well, they've asked me if I would not uh, 
write another edition of it and mm -hmm. have published perhaps for distribution in uh, educational institutions. And well, I, yeah, I would have to go back and rewrite it. But no, I'm not too interested to do that. You know, mm -hmm. so there you are in scenarios like that. Uh, I certainly am not of his frame of mind with uh, you know, the, the support of Monrovia, Liberia, you know, mm -hmm. the deportation, yeah. if you will, of those who, who were enslaved as an answer to gaining freedom in that respect. No, but you know, here is something too, we're coming back into, and I don't want to say correction, but coming back into a scenario of context, mm -hmm. of context, pull back into that time. That's why I always try to provide the occasion, the interaction as 200 years to the date, you know, 1823 now. I was not here in 1723. I'm not going to live to see 1923. So it's not the context, the whole point. It's our history. Right. It's our history. And, and so important as Americans, in my opinion, to remember where we've been, to have a better idea of where we are. And I think in Jefferson's mind, to keep us together as we sail forth, because he knew, and we need to remember as well in our time, we sail through uncharted waters. Man has mm -hmm. never been here before. So all of the eyes of the world continue to be upon us as to whether this American experiment in self-government is going to survive. There's a statement from 1823. Mm. It could be applicable now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very relevant. Very applicable it's very, now, very extremely relevant, relevant yeah. now. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Let's see. Maureen wonders, what are your favorite books on Jefferson? Well, Maureen, I, um, I always look back on Duma Malone as, uh, as very much um, a, uh, a, a, a Bible of, of Jefferson and his life. And I say that only because I cannot think of another author who uh, engaged almost mm -hmm. his entire life uh, to write the life. Uh, of an individual, and in this regard, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, uh, Duma Malone's first volume, and he wrote six volumes mm -hmm. on Jefferson, Jefferson and His Times. The first volume is published in 1949, and then the last, the sixth volume, comes out in 1979. Uh, Dr. Malone is just shy of 90 years old, and, uh, and yet Malone admits, you know, when people ask him, so you must have, you know, become very familiar with him. You must know everything about him. And Malone says, no, no one will ever know everything about him. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, that's oh, yeah. still holds. True. So even the footnotes are books in themselves. So I'd like to, to go back to the, the Malone. I, and, of course, Jefferson's writings in themselves are always the foundation. They are always the criteria. No matter how contradictory they are, and they, they certainly will continue to be, uh, to be relevant to him. Uh, I would say um, John Meacham's biography, The Art of, of Power, very, very worthy, very uh, relevant today in, in that study. Uh, Annette Gordon Reed's biography and the, her revelations about Jefferson and Hemings, uh, extremely relevant today and a foundation for everything that we continue to pursue and continue to reveal and continue to share in Jeffersonian studies. So my gosh, when you begin, where do you end on this? That's right, <laughs> keep going. Um, well, speaking of keeping going, we've got a couple more questions here. George asks if you have noticed shifts in attitudes towards Jefferson over the years and where they are now. Oh my heavens, <laughs> yes, of course, as they should be. And, uh, and again, no one would expect that more, in my opinion, than Jefferson, because there were so many shifts of opinion uh, about him during his mm. lifetime. And, um, you know, uh, remember, no one really knew, for the most part, that he was the author of the Declaration of American Independence until about the mid-1790s when we were seeing the growth of political platforms. When That's you crazy had, to think about, though. Is, yeah. Well, yeah, because they all wanted to keep it secret, Yeah, you know, initially at the beginning. And uh, when we create those political platforms, Federalist and Anti-Federalist, and they begin contending one on the other, it's like, well, all right, well, well, who were those men who wrote the Declaration of American mm -hmm. Independence? What did they intend? What was their original intent? 
And here it was Jefferson as the author. So, you know, the cat's out of the bag on that one, and it never ends in shifts back and forth mm. politically. He certainly fell out of favor at the time of our American Civil War. Um, he fell out of favor during the rest of the 19th century, for the most mm. part, even though we have a biography written uh, about him by James Parton, a very interesting biography. Oh, in the 1800s? Uh, it's in the late 1800s. Okay. Uh, yes, I think in the 1890s, where he's the one who makes the statement, if Jefferson is right, America is right. If Jefferson is wrong, America is wrong. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you know, during um, the 1920s, when we had uh, our terrible depression in 29, uh, whom do we elect to come to the helm but FDR? Mm -hmm. and, and Franklin D. Roosevelt is an avid and, and devoted Jeffersonian. And of course, he is, he is our president who brings Jefferson back into focus in commissioning and uh, inaugurating uh, the Jefferson Memorial, Memorial yeah. in Washington. Mm -hmm. right. So do, do, do we have a right to talk about removing uh, statues of Thomas Jefferson? Without question, we mm -hmm. have a right. We're Americans. And, and yet at the same time, you know, I think in my uh, persona, Mr. Jefferson would be the first to say, what do you mean a statue of me? Hmm. No, I do not want a statue of me. I do not want a school uh, named after me. So this yeah, is what we do. And how it changes over time. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it just even more recently kind oh, of yes. changing? Yeah, just, just flip-flopping back and forth. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well. We all have. We all have, Mon yeah. <laughs> and Monticello and Williamsburg, we can't help but, and, and thank heaven we can. Mm -hmm. Thank heaven we can hear this and receive this and talk about this and engage this. You know, that's what we do. That's what's such a pleasure about right. being engaged in history. Well, and talking about the words that he wrote and how they're still relevant and through time, how people have used them. You know, we talk about that a lot, the words of the Declaration of Independence, how they're still relevant today They've been used by others over time. So there's just always something interesting and, and relevant to talk about with Jefferson. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So well said. And, and to continue opening new avenues. True. To yeah. refer to and talk with him. Okay. One more question here. Arden wonders, with history taught less and less, how do you try to spark children's interest in history? Ooh, such a good question, <laughs> Arden. Come to Monticello. This brings us right back at the very beginning mm -hmm. when I was talking about uh, coming here as a young child and seeing so many families and young children coming here and, and their eyes opening and their curiosity sparked and, and their wonder uh, engaged. Who is this? What is this? What does this represent? One of our guides, oh, I wish I could remember their name, commented about leading a tour through the house and a young boy, a little boy, said to them, I get it now. Monticello is a metaphor. Mm, right. Yep. Is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So there you are, Arden. I, I think that's one way we do it. Um, um, whether we're inviting everyone to come here to Monticello or inviting everyone to uh, uh, visit Colonial Williamsburg or Mount Vernon or Montpelier or Ashlawn Highland, uh, any historical site. I think should be the effort of young families to introduce our future to, uh, to their history and uh, to help spark within them what may turn out someday mm -hmm. to steer us better through those <laughs> uncharted waters in which we are sailing as a nation. Right. Or to change the course of their life. To change the course of their lives. Exactly. Okay. Well, we'll end with a, a final question here. Are you ever tempted to hang up the tights? Huh. <laughs> what do you think? Hang up the tights. <laughs> hang up the tights. <laughs> well, first, let me say, um, they are not tights that I wear. Uh, if I were to be wearing tights, I would only think they're a bit uncomfortable for me. Uh, it would be a bit binding. But <laughs> I wear stockings. I wear stockings as they did mm -hmm. for, and um, well, maybe not those who are engaged in ballet, uh, but, but, but <laughs> Mr. Mr. Jefferson wore stockings that came up above his knee and they would have um, uh, garters that would hold those or more importantly, the um, uh, 
the britches mm. uh, strap mm -hmm. where you have britches buckles there. Uh, I do not intend any day soon to, to give that up. That's how I go to work. And um, yet I, I am hopeful that there'll, <laughs> there'll be some sign. Okay, this is it. <laughs> you know, time to hang up the hat. And I, I just hope my ears and my eyes will be open to that, my sentiments open to that, and, uh, and that I will realize it. And then also, more importantly, the observations of others to, to say, now, you know, we continue to refresh and rejuvenate mm -hmm. as it ought to be. The earth belongs to the living generation. Well, we sure are lucky to have you here, Bill. Oh, thank you. We um, enjoy you, your presentations on site, as well as all your live stream appearances. Um, and I've seen Bill in action many times, and with school kids, especially with school kids or other kids, it's just a fantastic thing to see. So we're really, really lucky to have you here with us, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. I'm, I'm really very fortunate to be here. Thank you all. And thank you for joining us. Join us again soon for the next Monticello live stream.